fellow Who Gazers, and welcome back to Doctor Who Literature, the new podcast taking you through the world of the Target novelizations in publication order. My name is Jason, and I'm your host on this journey, this very long journey. This is episode seven, but we're still only in the first three months of Target's own release schedule. January 1974 and March 1974 each saw two books released, one by Terence Dix and another by Malcolm Hulk. We discussed the two Hulk books in episodes five and six, and now we're back to Terence Dix and Doctor Who and the Day of the Daleks. Yes, I'm using the American pronunciation. This is the novelization of the season nine TV premiere, and to date, the most recent episode of the first seven books. Once again, we'll be joined for another guest interview, and a real pleasure this week, Tony Witt of the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast will be here to discuss Day and Terrence. Tony's long-running podcast has been addressing the Target books in story order, and I'm happy to have him here since he's been such a big influence on this show. But first, my own breakdown of Terrence Dix's second novelization. Let's get to it. Doctor Who and the Day of the Daleks, televised as Day of the Daleks, written by Terence Dix, teleplay by Lewis Marks, televised in January 1972, published in March 1974. Here's the back cover blurb to the U.S. Pinnacle reprint of the Target book. Exterminate, exterminate, the Daleks. Doctor Who's oldest and most ruthless enemies have one goal total world power. Their prime weapon is time travel. In the late 20th century, they attack the planet Earth. Their plan? Alter the course of human history. Start world wars. Wipe out the human population. They were very effective. Can Doctor Who, trapped in the 22nd century, reverse history's course in time to save our planet and every living thing on it, including himself, from the devastating and evil force of the Daleks? After having finished the back-to-back publications of Doctor Who and the Cave Monsters and Doctor Who and the Doomsday Weapon, I realized that it's been nearly two weeks since I last read a Terrence Dix book and three weeks since we last talked about one. And after finishing The Day of the Daleks, I looked up and saw that the next two books published after that weren't by Terrence either. That's only one Terrence episode out of a stretch of six or seven podcasts. Going forward, this is not going to be the norm. It's a bit of a culture shock, though, moving from two straight books by Malcolm Hulk back to Terrence. The only real similarity between Hulk's and Dix's style in the early going is that Terrence also lavishes a much bigger page count on the episode one material than he does the rest of the story. Episode one of Day of the Daleks takes up more than a third of the novelization. Terence uses the opportunity to expand the action and to provide us with brief but razor-sharp bits of characterization. But, outside of Chapter 1, he's not going to devote pages and pages to the internal thought processes of secondary and tertiary characters. While there are very striking POV scenes, there are also no invented histories, no quickly sketched portraits of the bad life choices that turn characters into villains. He's more concerned with plot than action. But even with that, this first third of the novelization is pretty riveting, in a way that few people accuse the corresponding TV episode of being. The TV version of Day of the Daleks suffered from a couple of common John Pertwee era problems. First, it was based on a script that, in spite of many alterations and drafts, just couldn't find its proper voice. Second, once written, it was hampered by direction that never quite got the point across. As is now well known following the 2011 DVD release, Day of the Daleks did not begin life as a Dalek story, and their late-in-the-day shoehorning into the script didn't leave the Daleks much opportunity to be menacing. Lewis Marks didn't completely embarrass himself with Planet of Giants, and would go on to write some good Doctor Who scripts after this one, but one of his weaknesses is that he never really elevated the companions beyond the screaming and being menaced stage. As a result, Day is not Joe Grant's finest hour, even in spite of Katie Manning's best efforts. 
Also on the DVD commentary, the late Barry Letts spent a bit of time gently critiquing, to put it mildly, the directorial choices made by the late Paul Bernard. Reading the novelization directly after watching the televised episode would appear to vindicate Letts. The film sequences, all the exterior scenes in both the 20th and 22nd century time zones, especially drag down the story in a way that you'd never have thought possible, not if you read the novelization first. Before the DVD special edition came out, about 35 years later, the novelization filled a void by adding lots of material, either cut for time on TV or never filmed in the first place. The entire opening chapter, Terror in the 22nd Century, is a gritty prologue opening the story in the 22nd century, rather than the 20th, and introducing the Daleks much earlier in proceedings. We begin with a wrecked Earth already in progress, and with the gorillas beginning to experiment with their time travel scheme, a scheme that will inadvertently cause the Daleks' conquest of Earth to occur in the first place. The devastating future world is seen through the eyes of gorilla leader Moni, M-O-N-I. He had a slightly different name on television. And it's a bleak view. Dix writes, Moni sat up and looked around cautiously. The enormous dormitory was packed with sleeping forms, drugged into total exhaustion by hours of brutal physical toil. One or two murmured and twisted and cursed in their sleep. A man screamed, No! No! Please don't! And then his voice tailed off into the mutterings of a nightmare. Moni saw that it was Soren. He had been beaten by the guards that morning for failing to meet his work norm. Soren was weakening daily. He wouldn't last much longer. Here, at his harshest and most uncompromising, Terence has Moni envision himself being torn to pieces by the Ogrons. The Ogrons, too, surpass their TV realization. Dix writes, Creatures somewhere between gorilla and man, they stood almost seven feet in height, with bowed legs, massive chests, and long, powerful arms that hung almost to the ground. Their faces were perhaps the most awful thing about them, a distorted version of the human face, with flat, ape-like nose, small eyes glinting with cruelty, and a massive jaw with long, yellow teeth. This is Terence's second time out writing for the Third Doctor, and his first Joe Grant endeavor. In what seems to be a recurring theme when Terence Dix writes for John Pertwee, the Third Doctor curses fluently in an obscure Martian dialect, see also Planet of the Daleks some years later. The Doctor rubs his chin twice, for those of you keeping score at home, so that's five times now in Dix's first two Pertwee novelizations. While we don't get the classic Dix description of the Third Doctor as having a young old face or a shock of white hair, which Terence would later call <clears throat> the Buffon on every single DVD audio commentary that he ever recorded, I quite like when Joe keenly observes the following about the Doctor's abrasive mentoring style. Sometimes, the Doctor seemed to think she understood the most difficult scientific theories as easily as he did himself. At other times, he had an infuriating habit of carefully explaining that two and two made four. The Doctor also amusingly compares travel by the gorilla's time machine negatively against the TARDIS. It was like comparing a trip in a luxury liner with going over Niagara Falls in a barrel. But it's not just the third Doctor that Dix describes. When the Daleks' mind control device reveals an image of the second Doctor, Terence, writing here before any Patrick Troughton stories had ever been novelized, describes him as having a humorous, rather comic face. The original edition's illustrations also picture Troughton at this point. One moment that jarred on TV was the Doctor's seemingly casual disintegration of two Ogrons during a chase scene at the end of Episode 2. This scene was heavily George lucas for the DVD special edition, if you know what I mean, and I think you do. But in the book, Terence surprisingly leaves it as is, as if he, like the director, wasn't aware at this point in the show's history that the Doctor never shoots first. Joe Grant, Terence writes, is very small and very pretty followed by a half-dozen variants on the same phrase. On TV, like I said earlier, Joe was not well-served, at least in my opinion. She accidentally catapults herself forward to the alternate 22nd century, and once there, immediately falls hook, line, and sinker for every lie or half-truth put forward by the Daleks and their human agent. She's impetuous, naive, gullible, and sleeps through an important council of war in the Part 4 material. 
Katie Manning made this work on TV through her earnest demeanor and didn't fall asleep, then Terrence also tries to salvage the character in this, the first time he's written for her. He shows us the Doctor mostly through Joe's eyes, the same as he did with Liz Shaw in the Auton Invasion novelization, and this helps humanize the character. Somewhat. Question? Who are they? Well, on the face of it, three rather desperate people. Well, they're criminals. They must be. Now, you're prejudiced. Well, aren't you? They tried to kill you and me. Yes, that's not in their favor, I'll admit. You know, we shouldn't really judge them until we find out why they're here. Well, come on, Joe. What about trying some of that escapology of yours? Well, I've been trying. The ropes are too tight. Well, I'll tell you what. Look, have a try. Have a try at untying mine. Okay. Got them? Where'd they come from? Well, technologically speaking, that gun of theirs is about 200 years ahead of its time. Your time, eh? The 22nd century visiting the 20th. A planned expedition through time to meet and kill an important politician. Now, why? Well, I'm the one who's supposed to be asking the questions. Yes, he's obviously not only important to us, he's also important to them. Or history, their history must talk a lot about Sir Reginald Styles, I think. And you mean they travel back in our time to try and change history? That's it, yes. How are you doing? Uh, not very well. These knots are rock hard. Well, in that case, there's only one thing left for us to do. I know. Wait. You're learning, Joe. A little more effort is made as well to get inside the heads of the three principal 22nd century guerrillas. In what will be a future Terence staple, he introduces Anat and Boaz and Shura all in the same paragraph. Of these, Anat, the leader, and eventually the only survivor of this gang, is the most interesting. Fierce courage, a passionate hatred of the enemy, and the cunning and caution that made her wait until the best moment to strike. Terence also takes care to imbue Anat with an actual appreciation for her having traveled in time. He writes, Dimly, Anna could see the woods and lawns of Austerley Park. She gazed at the peaceful landscape with a kind of wonder. Then she looked around the study. For the first time, she realized that she had actually journeyed into the past. The comfort and luxury of old houses, well-furnished rooms such as this, had long been things of the past when Anna was born. She reached out and touched the softness of the velvet curtains. And he allows her a moment of grace in her final scene. Writing... She stood for a moment, looking over the sea of rubble, the only world she had ever known. There were streaks of light in the east. Dawn was breaking. If the doctor succeeded, it might be a new dawn for all of them. If not, she could always go on fighting. She began to clamber across the rubble. Boaz gets a POV scene shortly before his death by self-sacrifice in episode 4. His death was badly staged on TV, but the addition of a POV scene gives that moment more impact. Shura's even larger act of self-sacrifice in the story's final minute is given a clearer motivation. We also see a lot more of Shura's journey back to Austerly House in the Part 4 material, and Terence does a good job of inhabiting his head as he embarks upon his futile and history-wrecking suicide bombing mission. Overall, Terence tries quite hard to imbue the guerrillas with personalities and motivations that never quite came across on TV. We learn that the guerrillas, in their secret base, Sip herbal tea, so 22nd century China wasn't conquered by the Daleks, then. Less clearly, Terence asserts that in this story's 21st century, mankind was both reduced to a Stone Age atavism before the Daleks showed up, and was able to build a monorail system. The exterior sequences, on film in the original story, are mostly made up of chases and escapes, but Terence makes these moments far richer in print than on TV, liberated as he is from Bernard's direction. The Doctor's escape by tricycle in Episode 3 is almost exciting here, as opposed to the low-speed escape from slow-walking extras that we got on TV. Terence is at his most poetic in describing what he thinks the landscape should have looked like. All around him was a scene of complete and utter desolation. Every inch of the countryside, as far as he could see, seemed to have been built up till not an inch was left, then methodically hammered down. A sea of rubble stretched before him. In the distance... A group of buildings stood out from the desolation. They were stark and ugly, made of rough concrete. They looked bleak and functional, with nothing attractive or welcoming about them. They looked, there was only one word for it, Dalicky. 
Terence recreates for the final chapter, All Kinds of Futures, a second Two Doctors and Two Joe Grant scene, bookending a similar moment in episode one. This had been planned for the broadcast, but never recorded. Terence also adds three new guerrilla characters for Moni's assault on Dalek HQ in episode four, to add some texture to a big fight scene that was rather rushed and undramatic on film. Terence lends a little more texture to the international politics that forms the basis of the 20th century half of the story, and, 1984 style, invents a quote from a future history text describing how civilization ended before the Daleks came. The Daleks are better than we saw on TV. Here, there's a black Dalek in command position, serving just under the quote-unquote even more powerful gold Dalek. The Black Dalek is described as sulky here, when he doesn't quite get his way. On TV, we had one gold Dalek, two regular Daleks, and that was it. One could actually apologize for Bernard here, given that he was expected to show the Daleks conquering 22nd century Earth, and then reinvading 20th century Earth with just three working Dalek props. Terence is under no such restriction here. The Dalek's human servant, the controller, even observes fear in these Daleks when they discuss the Doctor, again adding texture and richness that didn't come across on TV. That controller, by the way, also benefits from Dix's writing style. He gets about as many POV scenes as Anat does on the gorilla's side. His journey from Quisling, as Pertwee calls him on TV but not on the book, to the Doctor's ally is given more poignancy here. The controller tried to drown the memory of the Doctor's accusing voice, but it was no good. In his heart, he knew that everything the doctor had said was true. When he's first introduced, by the way, he's watching movement in the time vortex for, which the first time ever Terence calls, that mysterious void where time and space are one. Remember that line. We'll be seeing it again. And again. Dix writes the fight scenes with a greedy realism, absent from much of his later work. The Doctor's capture in the 22nd century in Episode 3 was a random head clonking, but here it comes after the Doctor attacked a vicious overseer and prevented an unfortunate human slave from being beaten. Shura's beating by an Ogron in Episode 2 is given a few extra beats, as is Boaz's Episode 4 death scene. One can also see the words that Terence loves to use over and over again, showing up several times here. Gleaming is used as an adjective six times, and strange and terrible each show up nearly as often. The Ogrons attack their prey with a savage roar of triumph, an archetypal Dick's phrase assigned to alien monsters the way that the Doctor, rubbing his chin thoughtfully, signposts whenever John Pertwee is about to appear. Less impressively, in Chapter 3, the word laboratory is used twice in the same sentence, but you can't win them all. Terence is always up for political satire. During the parade of 20th century dignitaries in the episode 4 material, Terence writes that the TV commentator was working very hard to make a series of pictures of middle-aged men getting out of their cars sound exciting. As a side note, one wishes that Terence would have had the opportunity to narrate the audiobook, especially when he writes the Doctor as being, quote, at the end of a long and grueling interrogation. And admit it. You'd rather I said that in Terence's voice. In the final analysis, as Terence said on the DVD commentary when describing the TV production of Day of the Daleks, read the book. The TV story has a great central premise, let down by indifferent directing. The book is the closest thing to the perfect image inside Terence Dix's mind before he edited the script and sent it off to the director. The DVD special edition corrects a lot of sins, but unless they can find the budget, and restage all the action sequences from scratch, the novelization is the closest we'll ever get to how this story should have looked. Next time, after seven months without a book release, Target will unwittingly celebrate my first birthday by releasing a pair of Pertwee novelizations, and both classics. Over the next two weeks, we'll have special guests join us to celebrate first Barry Letts' novelization of The Demons, and then Malcolm Hulks' novelization of The Sea Devils. And after those two guests are done with this show, things might never be the same around here. My copy of the book, similar to last week with the Doomsday Weapon, is not the Target edition, but the U.S. Pinnacle reprint. It's got a remarkable cover, 
which my guest and I will talk about a little bit after the break. It has the bespoke Pinnacle Doctor Who logo in gold, outlined in white and black, and the Day of the Daleks in gold print, and Terence Dix in uh, white just over the cover photo. The book opens with a single-page pull quote called Doctor Who Takes on the TARDIS, and it has a chapter uh, excerpt from Chapter 2 where the second Doctor and Joe show up out of time. Pages 2 and 3 are descriptions of the Daleks and the Doctor and his companions with a description of Joe Grant and a description of the Brigadier. There was supposed to be a description of the third Doctor here as well, but it appears to be absent. There's the introduction by Harlan Ellison, and I'll be talking about that introduction in detail probably when I get around to the novelization of The Android Invasion, which is the first time that I got a Pinnacle book and the first time that I read the Harlan Ellison introduction. The book's divided up into 14 chapters, which, as we'll see going forward, is unusual for Terence. He would be most noteworthy for writing 12 chapter books with the cliffhangers for parts 1, 2, and 3 neatly placed at the end of chapters 3, 6, and 9. Very symmetrical. I wrote episode 1 in rather juvenile uh, pencil handwriting on top of chapter 1, which has the evocative title, Terror in the 22nd Century. And the part 1 material goes all the way through page 46. What's interesting is that the part one cliffhanger occurs towards the end of chapter four, but not quite at the end. There's two more half pages of text before the chapter ends, but at that point, we're already in the episode two material. I wrote episode two in the paragraph break on page 46 where the cliffhanger occurs. I don't think that I wrote the cliffhangers in all at the same time, because where I wrote episode one and episode two out in words, for episode three, I only have the numeral three right next to chapter eight, The Fugitive in the Future. I think what happened here is that when I first saw Day of the Daleks on TV, it would have been by movie format on New Jersey Public Television, which we got on Long Island. And the cliffhanger sting was included uh, for the part two cliffhanger. So I knew before I'd ever seen the story in episode format exactly where the part two cliffhanger was. So I must have written the numeral three earlier and then gone back later and written in the other cliffhangers also in pencil. Although maybe that's not true because at the beginning of chapter 11, which starts the part four material, I again have the numeral four instead of the words episode four written out in longhand. And that's more than you'll ever need to know for the rest of your life about how young Jason marked off the cliffhangers in pencil to the Day of the Daleks novelization. At the end of the book, Pinnacle does their usual job of advertising their other series. So once again, as with the Doomsday Weapon novelization, we have a two-page summary of the Richard Blade series by Jeffrey Lord. The Richard Blade series is the continuing saga of a modern man's exploits in the hitherto uncharted realms of worlds beyond our knowledge. Richard Blade is every man, that's capital E by the way, and at the same time a mighty and intrepid warrior. Richard Blade battles man, beast, and forces unnamed. And of course the tagline is an incredible time-space journey to Dimension X. The last page of the book is an advertisement for the Knight Rider novelizations. Your favorite episodes of the hit TV series Knight Rider are available in paperback from Pinnacle. There are three of these. Knight Rider is book one. Hearts of Stone is book three. And book two, which we'll talk a little bit more about after the jump, is called Trust Doesn't Rust, which I can't decide if that's awful or marvelous. Uh, Probably a little more awful than it is marvelous. So that's my copy of Doctor Who and the Day of the Daleks. After the break, I'll be joined by my very special guest, and we'll have a conversation about the book and about several other related topics. Who's got the power, the power to read? Who looks into books for the answers we need? And we are back, and I am thrilled to be joined by a man who is the number one name in Doctor Who 
Target Books Podcasting, Tony Witt. Tony, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Your show, the Doctor Who Target Book Club Podcast, I hope I got that name right. You did. Has been around for, I think, three or four years now. And you've been going through, whereas I'm doing the books in publication order and discussing the literary evolution of the line, you are going in story order. How did your show come about? It came about because I wanted to wanted to do a podcast, wanted to do a Doctor Who podcast, and saw that Doctor Who Target Books had pretty much already been done, but the only podcast that was out there at that time, which had just gone defunct before I started mine, uh, was doing them out of order. And I thought, oh, well, I wonder if anyone's actually just done these all the way straight through in order. And I knew that there were blogs <clears throat> such as yours that did them in publication order. So I figured, why not do them in story order and bring along two or three people who had never watched the show so that they could see it for the first time themselves, but through books. And that's why we did it that way. And what uh, book slash novelization are you up to now? We just finished recording. Uh, well, we just released the episode of the recording of Power of Kroll. And we'll be starting the new year in January by doing a recording of... Oh, I keep forgetting it because it's a terrible story. Um, <laughs> the, the last key to time story. That would be the Armageddon Factor. I can't believe I'm forgetting. That is indeed the Armageddon Factor. That's the one I'm forgetting because it is so indeed forgettable. But that's where we are right now. It's interesting because Armageddon Factor is the exact moment where Douglas Adams takes over Doctor Who. And you can see the hard left turn the story takes once Adams scripts episode, script edits the last episode. So it's kind oh, of yeah. jarring that you go from this gritty, realistic war story to Douglas Adams-style comedy, all in the same serial. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I, I don't know how much of that is going to reflect in the novelization, of course, because that was Terrence Dix doing his eight books a year, 90 pages a story. Uh, he might not have all the uh, Douglas Adams-style uh, over-the-top comedy, perhaps. We'll I'm see. almost certain that he does not. Uh, for that matter, that's part of the reason why David Fisher hated Terrence Sticks' novelization of Stones of Blood, because <laughs> he just didn't capture much of the actual um, joy of it, what there is of it. I don't think we're going to see that in Armageddon Factor either. Although it's funny that you mentioned Power of Kroll, because that was the last Terrence Dick's book that I had read at the time that he died, which was a little over two years ago now. So when I did my tribute uh, post to him on my blog, and when I did a guest spot on Reality Bomb talking about Terrence Sticks in Memoriam, that was the book that I pointed to as him pretty much at the height of his descriptive powers. Now, obviously, it's not even close to his best book. It's about 50 pages shorter than the book we're going to discuss today. But I thought there was a lot of good Terrence Sticks material in Power of Kroll especially the way he brings out some of the politics of Robert Holmes's underlying script, which kind of got lost on TV because the TV production was so dreadfully dreary. What did you guys have to say about Power of Kroll? Well, the other two panelists, uh, Dalton Hughes and Jenny Ingersoll, both didn't think much of the story, but when I told them that the book was an improvement on the televised story, uh, that gave them... Yeah, that gave them a moment to consider because it really is an improvement on the televised story because, as we've said in the podcast numerous times, Terrence Dix always pays close attention when he's adapting a script from Robert Holmes. The only problem is, on Power of Kroll, Robert Holmes himself was essentially straight-jacketed by the higher-ups at the BBC and told, get rid of the comedy, don't put all this witty stuff that you normally put in, and also give us the biggest monster that Doctor Who has ever seen, <laughs> when the BBC is notorious for not even being able to do man-sized monsters particularly well. And you had a director who was asleep at the switch and forgot that there was an extra crewman on the refinery about halfway through the story. So many <laughs> things went wrong in production. 
Yeah, absolutely. Now, it's interesting you say that that was the book that you read when you were reading when Terrence Dix died, because looking back at my notes for Day of the Daleks, I realized that that's the episode that we did the memoriam for him because we had just recorded the episode when we got news of his death. Oh, wow. I will include a link to that episode then in the show notes for this one. I know that the episode that I released last week, which is the novelization that came out the same month as Day of the Daleks, was the Doomsday Weapon. And mm-hmm. coincidentally, cause, let's say that again in English, coincidentally, that was the one episode that I did on your show probably about two or three years ago. Yes, it was. Although that was the very beginning of my podcast career, so my audio style was uh, much more rough, hopefully, <laughs> compared to where <laughs> compared to where I'm at today. I think you're giving yourself. I think you're being way too critical of yourself. You were absolutely fine. We've been wanting to have you back on the podcast for ages. Well, you've got a pretty good run of my favorite stories coming up with season 18. So let's have that conversation afterwards. Yes, definitely. But Tony, what book are we here to talk about today? We are talking about Day of the Daleks, which may be one of the finest Dalek novelizations written until we get Ben Aronovich. And that's a long stretch of time between those two books. It is a very long stretch. What's interesting here is that this is Terrence at the very beginning of his novelization's career. And this book comes out in the middle of season 11 which was his final year as script editor on the show Mm -hmm. so he is busy rewriting monster of peladon from scratch and writing this bumper sized book at the same time and it's amazing that the book is actually better than some of the tv stories that went out uh, that year at the same time much better (laughs) so my copy of day of the daleks i'm holding it up if you can see the video is the pinnacle edition oh yeah amazing david mann cover art with the uh, I'm trying to think of the word, the anthropomorphically correct Ogron. Right. The, the unit spaceship, which of course doesn't appear in the story, but it's a great uh, little touch. It's, it's a very evocative cover, even though of course it has nothing to do with the episode, which the artist probably didn't even have a chance to see living in the States. Right. Which edition do you have? Um, I have that one. Um, I actually reread the PDF version that I have of the first edition. So I've got that beautiful artwork on the cover from the late Chris Achilios, who we just recently lost. Yes. And that really is an evocative cover. In fact, this, um, this book really kind of hits all cylinders, doesn't it? Not only do you have great prose, but you have great covers whenever it's been released and re-released. Even the Dalek on that Pinnacle version, even though it's very different from most Daleks, is still it, it's a it's a nice redo of that particular. Yeah. And That's the Dalek the actually has three arms. It has the sucker in the middle yes. and has a gu- it has a gun on either side, which is an incredible if you think about it, a Dalek with two guns makes all the sense in the world because you have a lot more oh, covers yeah. that way. Yeah, exactly. And yet they kept the sucker stick, so. <laughs> now, let me ask you, um, the PDF, that would be probably from the original Target cut, does that have internal illustrations? Because the Pinnacle books, when they came out here in the States, omitted the internal illustrations entirely, which is a shame because especially with Doomsday Weapon, as Mark and I talked about last week, you are missing a, a lot of good internal pictures. It does have them, and they are amongst the best ones produced for the target range because I think even the artists were starting to get tired by the time you got into the later books with illustrations, but at this point, the illustrations still look like the people that they're meant to depict, except for one. There's there's one that shows the Doctor being strapped down to the um, mind probe. Oh, no, not the mind probe. And you see Troughton on a large screen above him, but Troughton has Pertwee's hair. So it's not quite clear why that is, but he looks exactly like that transitional state from the fan film. Um, oh, God, I'm going to forget the name of it, where Troughton actually... Uh, regenerated into Pertwee, but there was an intermediate. Of course, when this book came out in 1974, that fan film would have been at least a couple of decades away, so that would be serendipity on the artist's part. (laughs) Yes, exactly. 
but yeah, these illustrations are marvelous. So as I talked about earlier on this show, the part that I recorded before you joined me, I spent quite a bit of time talking about what Terrence adds to the story that we didn't get on television. And this was, of course, a pretty notoriously troubled production. You have a director that the producer ended up badmouthing quite at length Ooh. on the eventual DVD audio commentary. You have the infamous fact that there's a whole missing scene at the end where the doctor and Joe are supposed to meet <laughs> themselves yes. in Unit HQ, tying into the beginning. And they just never filmed it, which means that the whole opening sequence is meaningless. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a production team that forgot how to do Dalek voices, so the Dalek voices just don't sound anything like they're supposed to. Mm -mm. And the, the Daleks' great stratagem at the end is to approach the house from one side, <laughs> leaving everyone to escape out the back door uh, completely unharmed. So uh, the TV episodes are regrettably not worth writing home about. And when I watched the Pertwee era in sequence for my Twitter pilgrimage last year, uh, it was just a huge noticeable dip in quality from the demons down to this. However, and I've just spent a good two minutes bad-mouthing the TV production, the book manages to uncover or rather heal all those sins and tell a much better story. So from your point of view, how does this stack up to what we got on television? It not only rehabilitates the story, it essentially made my panelists want to see the story. And I said, um, yeah, you may want to put a cork in that because <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to watch it, you're going to have to watch the restored version. And I say restored in quotes there because that's the version that comes closest to realizing what Dix was trying to do on the page with this one. Uh, even though I know there are purists out there that say no old Doctor Who story should ever be redone with new special effects and all, I, I don't think even those purists would argue that Nicholas Briggs should not have come in and redone the Dalek voices for that story. Because oh, even that really little change creates just a world of difference. The original Daleks' uh, voices are horrible. That being said, you don't have to endure them on the page. You actually have a ravening Dalek horde coming down on the house rather than two Daleks and the gold Dalek. And in fact, they couldn't use that one because that was the gold Dalek. So they only had two having to be constantly, you know. Yeah, it, as you said, absolute mess. And the book is far and away better. In fact, um, I reread it over the course of today and yesterday and got through it really quickly and found myself slowing down because the prose was just that good. I had forgotten how good this book is. Oh, agreed, agreed. I'm curious, going back to the special edition for a sec, I know I would have watched the special edition when that disc first came out, which is probably about 10 years ago now. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, as and I hesitate to say the word, I am a purist when it comes to the, the classic series. When I was doing my pilgrimage, I only watched the original editions because mm. I was trying to get a sense of the visual <clears throat> evolution of the show, which is considerable, especially in the early years. And I didn't want to cheat myself by depriving myself of the displeasure of Paul Bernard's <laughs> direction. But, but it, it's noticeable because this is the Daleks' first TV story in five calendar years, going back to 1967. And their reveal at the cliffhanger is so poorly done and so oh, undramatic. Yeah. And the Doctor's first face-to-face -face encounter with the Dalek in, in the tunnel in the 20th century is just it's so limply made. It's like the director didn't realize that the Daleks were important and that this was their first big return in five years and that they were a big freaking deal. I'm yep. curious, does the special edition do anything to restore that? I'd have to look at it again. I seem to recall that one of the biggest problems with that cliffhanger, when you get the recap at the beginning of episode two is that the sting is playing over it. Right, right. That there's an editing problem of some sort and I think that might be corrected in the special edition. I have to admit, I didn't go back and rewatch it, and I really want to. Having That's the other thing about this book. If it makes you want to go back and rewatch the story, then it's achieved its purpose, to my mind anyway. Agreed. And your panelists actually bought into that by wanting to see the story. 
Oh yeah. They Just, they rated this book very highly. In fact, uh I think it was four point fives out of five across the board. That's terrific. And especially the TV story is not really rated that highly. So the book opens with a prologue that probably would have been impossible to film on television. But it's something the Target books weren't doing a lot of, especially in the early years. This is only the fourth Target book. There's this huge prologue with uh, Moni, who has a different name on television, and then the Daleks controller. Uh, It's, at least in the Pinnacle edition, a nine-page chapter which sets the scene. What strikes you about the fact that Terrence opens the story with two scenes that weren't televised, and how does the prose in this chapter compare up Especially because you've just endured a long <laughs> run of, you know, season 15 slash season 16 adaptations yes. where Terrence had too much on his plate and didn't have nearly the time or the word count that he had back in 1974. So mm-hmm. how, how did you how, how did you take that? I, I took it as this is the sort of writing we would have had from Terrence Dix had he been given the time and reflection on all of the novelizations, because I I, I have to admit, I don't really care much for uh, his standalone novels later. But when he is novelizing at his pinnacle, (laughs) no pun intended, (laughs) he is really doing the best job possible. And this, both this book and um, Spirit from Space, Auton Invasion, Um, both of those books show somebody who is at least committed to creating more of the world of the story on the page, whereas by the time you get to Power of Kroll, the only reason he's bringing new stuff in is because he realizes it wasn't on the screen. And that's the only reason, and it's Bob Holmes, and he's going to do his best by Bob Holmes. Here, he's doing his best by everybody. And it really shows Uh, the fact that he committed not only nine pages there, but also I believe we don't actually start with what happens on television until the top of chapter two, if I remember correctly. I was looking back at my notes. Right. Chapter two, which is it's a great chapter title. I know if you look at Terrence's later chapter titles, they're all two words, you know, the this, the that, (laughs) the occasional escape to danger. But here we've got terror in the 22nd century. And chapter two is The Man Who Saw a Ghost, which is, you know, a short story in and of itself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's so evocative. It is amazing. And he does go out of his way here, and not so much in later books, because, as you said, um, he has too much on his plate. And we have to give him some of the blame for that because he was the one who wanted that. He wanted this extra income stream and that's fine. That's perfectly fine. More power to him, but it also meant that the more product he was producing, the less the quality of the product, at least to my mind. I think if he were aware that we would still be talking about what he probably thought were throwaway books 40 years later and devoting years of our lives to making podcasts about them, Maybe he would have tackled it a little bit differently. Possibly, <clears throat> though I have a feeling, having having heard interviews with him and things about um, why he didn't adapt the original story he submitted for Brain of Morbius rather than Robert Holmes, you know, ground up rewrite of it. Right. He he was more committed to producing what was on screen than to really doing that sort of effort all the time. In fact, it's kind of surprising given his later thoughts on it, that these early books are as good and as strong as they are at all. Because as you said, day of the Daleks doesn't tend to score well with people. And in some ways you could say, Oh, it's a fairly pedestrian story. It's not when he puts his hands on it. And that's not always the case. Right. Right. And just, you know, the style of prose, he talks about the, he talks about what people are wearing. He talks about the owl that's hooting in the distance. He really puts you in the scene a lot more than the director ever did in the uh, television story. Yeah. And it's not because Louis Marx has created a particularly good script because Louis Marx does a much better job with Planet of Evil and Terrence Dix doesn't necessarily pull out all the stops for that one. 
True, and by the time it came to Mask of Mandragora, uh, oh, the novelization God. was done. I can hear you being triggered <laughs> in the background. I know your thoughts on Mask of Mandragora, but yeah. he didn't, in that one he, he assigned to Philip Hinchcliffe and didn't even write himself. <laughs> oh, yeah, poor Philip Hinchcliffe. Wonderful producer, wonderful human being, wonderful alternate doctor. <laughs> yes, yes. Not a great prose stylist, and certainly <laughs> can't even call him script to page because he has a tendency to chop things out that really need to be there. Like big whacking chunks of the Seeds of Doom, for example. Oh, yeah, I, I can never forgive him for Seeds of Doom. Our panelists hated that book, and I said, no, this is a fantastic story, but you can't is, tell from the book. It is one of the best TV stories. It's permanently lodged in my top ten. Mm-hmm. And you know, I like the book for what it is, but when I read it, I'm always aware that you know 25 percent of it is missing. Yeah, yeah. Whereas this is just the opposite. This has 20 percent extra and then some, mm. including what I think is probably uh, apart from that missing scene, which you're right. It was egregious that the director should have overrode both the producer and the script editor and said, "Nope, we're just not going to film that." episode's too long it's gonna sorry nope not gonna do it they also cut the line about oh in which the doctor says i thought i'd destroy them some time back which refers to evil of the daleks right and that's back in the novelization as well it should be because the we nippers um reading this in early the early 70s needed to be reminded that the doctor had defeated them before and had destroyed them before and they weren't getting evil of the Daleks as a novelization anytime soon. And again, Louis Marx did not have the Daleks in his original outline. That was a million miles from what he wanted to do. And the way that the enormous Kroll monster was forced upon Robert Holmes in the late Mm seventies, the Daleks were kind of forced upon the writer here. So you have a writer who didn't want to tell a Dalek story and a director who didn't want to tell a story at all. <laughs> so that's perhaps not the most felicitous of production environments. But now, you know, my thing when I was a kid is when I opened a book, when I opened the novelization, and it was a big deal for me, you know, I had this deal with my parents where in exchange for babysitting my kid's sister, I got two books every other week. Oh, wow. So I would that's spend, a sweet deal. <laughs> and then if I, if I babysat for her on Saturday nights when my parents went out, that would be a third book. So oh, wow. you can imagine me standing there at my suburban mall Walden books with my head cocked to one side, looking at the shelves. And this is, you know, the mid eighties. This is the height of Dr. Who Phantom in America. And at this point you had two shelves just of Dr. Who novelizations alone. And these are slim books. That's a lot of books per shelf. And I had to figure out which of all these books, and I can only get two or three, which am I going to pick out today? So when I got home, Number one, I had to make the books last longer than 24 hours because otherwise it was a two-week wait until the next set. Right. And then more importantly, I wanted to have The Doctor on page one because if I read a book like The Ice Warriors, which I'll get to in this podcast shortly, you have, you've got to wait 17 pages for The Doctor to appear. And it can be frustrating because you know these aren't the characters you care about. I wanted The Doctor in the blue box right there at the beginning. Right. Day of the Daleks is interesting because at least in the Pinnacle version, Doctor doesn't show up until page 15. Yeah. But does the book drag for you until the doctor shows up, or was it so good that you didn't even notice that he wasn't even on the page? Well, um, it. <clears throat> I actually am more of the opposite school of thought that any any story that can sustain itself well without the doctor for the longest time is a pretty decently constructed story. And that being said, no, this didn't drag for me at all. As a matter of fact, uh, it was really lovely to revisit this and remember oh he did add all of this we've uh, on the on our podcast we've we're always happy when Terrence Sticks gives us prologue because it's always something special even if it's power of crawl it's always something special and it's always an addition to the existing story and in this one it's lengthy you get that map How often do we get a map in a Doctor Who um, novelization? We get one in Cave Monsters, and that's the only other um, one I can think off the top of my head. Unfortunately, I've got the Pinnacle Edition. And you don't have the map. (laughs) I am going to have to 
track down the original edition and get a copy of that. I don't like having multiple copies of books, so I've been sitting on the pinnacle for, you know, 35 right. odd years. But if there's a map, I, I need to see that. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you the PDF. Because That's it's terrific. pretty easy. That's terrific. Thank you. <laughs> I, and the weird thing about it is it doesn't actually add anything to the story. Just like the illustrations, they don't necessarily add anything to the story. That prologue, obviously, it wasn't in the televised story. It wasn't in the script. It's all Terrence Dix. You could argue that it doesn't necessarily add anything to the story if the stories can survive without it. The fact that it has it just expands that vista of the story immensely. And... Anytime I get a novelization that has extra material like that, I'm I'm in I'm on for the ride. I am desperate now to know how your guys are going to react to the horns of Nymon and what they're <laughs> going to make of that because you have that's one of Terence's best prologues, even if I yeah. do say so myself, mm-hmm. and he adds so much to the rather I think one dimensional is too charitable the characters that we got on television. Yeah, they're almost in negative dimensions, aren't they? And of course, that's all in a good service because some of those performances are incredible. But Terrence gives more backstory to Soul Deed and some of the other characters than is ever evident on screen. They're probably going to walk away from that novelization thinking that they're going to be getting a Star Wars for uh, 1979. Oh, it's ridiculous. And if by incredible you mean unable to be believed, I would definitely <laughs> agree. <laughs> The weird thing about uh, Horns of Nymon is actually that's my first novelization. That's oh, the first really? one wow. I ever got as a kid. Yeah, wow. it was a, it, our local PBS station was doing it as a premium. They you know sent you a random target novel if you contributed five dollars a month. So got that mm-hmm. along with the um, Adventures of Canine and Other Mechanical Creatures book which has fallen to bits. I still have the original, but it's fallen to bits because the spine was awful. But I still have my original copy of Horns of Nymon, and that was my first introduction to Terrence Dix. And my first reaction, because I knew the story already, was why did it have to be this one? I was not happy. And then I read the prologue and thought, oh, okay, this isn't going to just be that awful story that I saw on television. And I will say, in defense of the Horns of Nymon, the purple spine is an incredible, gorgeous design cover. Isn't it? Yeah. And that was another thing that upset me a bit, (laughs) that I never got any other books that looked that good from the side. (laughs) It was just bizarre. When I was a kid, I had the books double booked on a shelf in my childhood bedroom. So all the Hartnolls and Troutons and Pertwees were in the back. And then uh, the front, I had, you know, the Bakers and the Davisons and eventually the Colin Bakers and the McCoys. But I wake up every morning and the first thing I see is the, is the front row of novelizations. And you have this long run of story from Planet of the Spiders all the way up to Creature from the Pit. Every book, except for one, is white. Mm-hmm. As a trivia question, which one book in that run does not have a white spine? Oh, I know this. I really do. In fact, I, I'm looking across the room, so I should be able to... Yeah, but my vision is terrible. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the club. Turning 45 was a big mistake. <laughs> well, you shouldn't turn 51 then. Uh, let's yeah. see. Looking oh, all years behind across you. the room, it is... Oh, I am not going to get it right. I am not going to get it right because we haven't gotten to it, whatever it is yet. I was so wrong be... because actually Ark in Space is yellow, which is also a nice bold color, but everything oh, else that's right. Yeah. Everything else onwards is so it's the Sunmakers. The Sun at least my edition of the Sunmakers has a dark orange spine, but everything yep. else before and after that is white for years and years worth of books. And as soon as you said that, I, I can spot it. I can actually spot it on the on the shelf because it's sitting right there beside all these other white books, except, oh, I see. I've got some pinnacles shoved in there, too, so mm. there are some black spines along beside them. Right, right. Um, I don't have every... I think I have seven out of the ten pinnacles. Uh, Talons of Wang Chiang, for whatever reason, showed up in the States as a target. Same with Revenge of the Cybermen. And I mm. think in Dinosaur Invasion I also have as a target, rather than the, the infamous pinnacle edition, where it's a fourth Doctor book. 
Yeah, the pinnacles are actually pr still pretty easy to find. And if you go on eBay, they don't charge a lot for them because they're not considered... Well, Larry M Van Mersbergen would know this better than I would, but they, they're not considered nearly as collectible. Even though, and I think that I suspect that's because there are target versions of all of them, as opposed to, say, you know, the White Lion version of the Crusaders that has Tom Baker on the cover. And also the volume. Pinnacle was doing one release of the book every year. So there was a 79, an 80, an 82, an 83, an 84 printing. Then the only difference is they would change the logo on the cover. They would change the color. But mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, if you're doing five printings in five years, and all these books are selling. That's a lot of stock. It really is. And you think they could have done more than that because all they needed to do, as you said, was come up with new cover art and go through and change all the Britishisms to Americanisms. And that doesn't take that much time. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. <laughs> but the, the, the logo is just so... I love the logo, even though it has nothing to do with with any of the Doctor Who logos that were commissioned. It's kind of cool. Yeah, the show should really do a logo like that, shouldn't it? Because it doesn't look like any of the TV logos at all. Maybe for the 60th anniversary, we can persuade Russell T. Davis to slap the Pinnacle logo on the 60th anniversary <laughs> special and see if anybody notices. <laughs> I, I have a feeling his suggestion box is pretty darn full at the moment. <laughs> yeah, you think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Something else that I did as a kid is, and again, you're not going to find too many more kids who were nerdy about the novelizations than me. I would limit myself to reading one episode a night. So I would either know where the cliffhanger was if I'd seen the story on television, or I would just guess by dividing the page count into, into the number of episodes. So it was always a hardship for me if a particular part of an episode ran on for too long, like Dragonfire. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to read in that format because literally half the book is episode three. Yes. It's like 80 pages. <laughs> and same with the novelization, The Crusaders. You got, you know, it's a 160 page book. It was just too much for me at age 11 to be able to read some of those dense, small print, long chapters in one night. Yeah. So with, with Day of the Daleks, the cliffhanger for part one is on page 46 of the Pinnacle edition. And the book starts on page one, whereas the targets start on page seven. So that's 46 pages of text just for part one alone. But mm -hmm. it, it just flies by, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. I I had to remind myself that this is also one of his longer novelizations. It's not by any means the longest, but that's the other thing. He's not as worried about page counts at this point, and he's willing to allow his own imagination to fill in the blanks where the script doesn't. And I really wish we had a Terrence Sticks like this novelizing, novelizing later stories like Kinda, because that's coming, mm. and it's not a good novelization, even though it is far and away a much more imaginative story than this in some ways. Yeah, if you had 1973 Terrence Sticks tackling Kinda, then you'd we'd be speaking a lot more highly of the novelization of the book and in the same breath as we do with the story, probably. Although, in his defense, when he was writing Day of the Daleks, his only alternative was to drive to work and rewrite Monster of Peladon. So <laughs> yes. he was probably spending more time on Day of the Daleks so he wouldn't have to go back and face Monster of Peladon for one more day. Oh, I don't blame him. I really don't, because I still can't stand that story. But, yeah. And then he had to turn right around and novelize the damn thing. Although, I would argue, I mean, it's, it'll be a long time before I get to it on this show, but I think with Monster of Peladon, he actually manages to improve because part one of the TV story is a mess of rapid-fire exposition, a recap of what's happened since Curse of Peladon two years earlier. And it, it's almost, you know, chibnall era pacing. You're like, wait, wait, what just happened? Like, ten things happened there, and I missed all of them. <laughs> right. Whereas in the book, he's able to go back and say, all right, now, this is what happened here, and this is what happened there, and this is why we're talking about it again. Well, I should hope so. He's the one that wrote the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's, uh, at least he was able to go back and fix it. Whereas here, Day of the Daleks, he's not just fixing the story, but he's almost reinventing it. Yeah, he really is. He's doing the exact opposite 
of what he did with the junior Doctor Who stories that we uh, reviewed on my podcast maybe a few weeks back, where he's chopping his own novelizations to the bone, and you can really tell. I have been hesitant to read those for exactly that reason. It's kind of like reading the novelization of Seeds of Doom, right? You're like, oh, wait, there should be a whole big thing here, and there should be a whole big thing there, and it's gone. You notice it with one book, and you don't notice it with the other one. So you can absolutely tell which one was done first. Mm. It's it, it really is just a shock, because it's the, it's the exact opposite uh, order, in fact. Giant Robot is the one that he did second, and it is chopped to the bone, and it suffers for it. Whereas Brain of Morbius actually still reads pretty well, except for a bizarrely changed ending, because I guess you don't want your four-year-olds to hear about people throwing themselves in the fires understandably <laughs> no not at all maybe he should have novelized the 60 minute vhs edit of brain of morbius instead <laughs> that's what it feels like <laughs> it really does feel like a novelization of that i, I know we're getting slightly off topic but uh, when my friend and i went to see the woman who fell to earth in the theater this would mm -hmm. have been i guess 2018 did that come out yeah <sighs> there was a problem with the fathom event live stream Oh, no. So the theater was maybe about 25 to 30% full. You know, this is a big stadium-style seating theater in downtown Brooklyn on Court Street, and not a lot of folks showed up for Jodie Whittaker's first story, but we're sitting there in the dark for 20 minutes, and they haven't started the darn thing. So somebody runs downstairs and grabs the manager. The uh, manager flips a switch, and the first thing we see is Tom Baker introducing the story. And I'm like, wait a minute. Why would Tom Baker record a special introduction for a Jodie Whittaker story? turns out they were showing from three months earlier the theatrical release of the cut down special edition movie version of genesis of the daleks <laughs> and it was still in their in their buffer and they were showing that which is the previous fathom event rather than woman to fell to earth oh, so i'm no. sitting there watching this cut down version of genesis of the daleks that i hate to say it because i am not a not my doctor person i am not a jody hater I think I enjoyed watching the brief cut down Genesis that I did the actual <laughs> woman who fell to earth, which um, Jody aside, I don't like that script. Yeah. It's not so, a great script. I guess that's one sense where the cut down is actually an improvement over some other formats of Dr. Who. Well, if ever you get Trey Corte talking about the LP version of Genesis of the Daleks, he oh says the fact that there is an LP version and it basically hits all the points it needs to tells you how over padded the TV story is. Mm. I tend to disagree with him there because if it's good padding, it's it's good. But yeah, <laughs> good padding can be better than bad action. And I think coming back to the day of the Daleks for a second, I think Terrence proves that good padding is better than the actual meat of the story. I agree that the chase sequence, for instance, um, the chase on that ridiculous. Uh, what would you even call it? It's a I I I grew up with them. They were called quad runners, but it doesn't have four wheels. It has three. And John Pertwee and Katie Manning are going through what appears to be a field of brush. Yes, being chased by extras in Ogron costumes, and it is the most embarrassing chase sequence ever on the page. Oh my God! Isn't From that the Joe's one where they? They drive up the side of the house, right? Yes, yes. Joe thinks that they have actually literally driven up the side of the house and then come down the other side. Oh, that is and, a great detail. Yeah, the way he describes it is just mir miraculous. That That is a chase sequence that if you can easily skip through it in the TV version, as short as the TV version is, and you don't want to skip it on the page at all. I know there's a line in the discontinuity guide from the mid nineties, and I'm pretty sure it was a Keith topping line. Uh, Day of the Daleks did for tricycle sales. <laughs> what mixomatosis <laughs> did to rabbits. That would not surprise me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know when I was a kid, I think this is a book that I got before I watched the TV because growing up in New York, I had like seven different channels showing seven different PBS channels showing Doctor Who all at once. Oh, wow. You had a channel out of Boston. You had uh, New York City Public Television. I had the Long Island Channel. You had New Jersey Public Television. You had um, 
there was a TV, uh, a PBS station out of Scranton, Pennsylvania, which also aired Doctor Who. So if you timed your night correctly, you could watch Doctor Who multiple times on a Saturday at different points in the run. Oh, wow. So it was New Jersey Network, which got the Pertwee run first in 1985, which is just after I got into the show. It would have been 11 going on 12. Mm -hmm. But they aired like in movie format at 11 p.m. on Saturday. You know, I still had a bedtime back then. And that was, of course, the night my parent, my mother needed Saturday night to, you know, tape whatever was airing on PBS when she and my dad went out. So I didn't get to see a lot of the Pertwees again until like 1987 when Channel 21, the Long Island station, started airing them in episode format. Mm -hmm. So the most exciting bit of Day of the Daleks for me, the book, is this really short micro chapter, chapter 10, Interrogation by the Daleks. Oh, yes. Which is where they... Uh, start to use the mind probe on the doctor then he starts describing the doctor's previous faces and i guess that's where the target version has the illustration of trout and wearing pertwee's hairstyle <laughs> right <laughs> that's exactly it and yeah even something like that you could think of as padding because of course the daleks don't need to verify that this is the doctor because we know it's the doctor the dalek you know, it it's there simply to give certain other bits of the story enough time to cohere right yeah it doesn't feel that way when it's on the page and that says something to the quality of this novelization that even the bits that are absolutely there as connective tissue just to get you from scene a to scene d do not feel like connective tissue. And Target had reprinted the Frederick Muller books, I think, in 73. But this is the first time in a proper Target book that you actually get a description of the first Doctor. Yes. Yes. And Indeed. It's the, it's the first time that Terrence Six gets to use one of his shorthand descriptions. An old man with a sharp, querulous face. Which That's a great word, querulous. You would never see that word in a kid's book today, right? No, and he doesn't use it for his other Hartnell novelizations either. I, as you said, it, yeah, he because he didn't get to write a lot of the Hartnell novelizations. Right, um, right. Dalek Invasion of Earth, I think? Yeah. That was the first one, right? Jerry Davis did his own Tenth Planet. Right. And then when Nigel Robinson uh, became the editor, and I know you've had Nigel on your show, yes. he was trying to get the original TV screenwriter wherever possible, which often meant getting someone who had written for Doctor Who 20 years ago who had never written a proper novel before, who have sometimes challenging relationships with uh, regular prose. And yet those are some of my favorite, favorite novelizations for the same reason I love this one, because they're expansions of the basic story and sometimes reimaginings of what we already got. Like the John Luke Wrighty version of The Massacre, which tells a story that he wanted to tell rather than the one that Donald Tosh ended up writing, right? Yeah, I'm I'm not a big fan of John Lucarotti. I am a big fan of the Massacre novelization. Mm. Even with that weird prologue that actually has the Time Lords talking <laughs> to the First Doctor. Yes, that's right. Uh, chronologically out of sequence. Yeah, there's no way that should happen, and yet it does, and it's still kind of marvelous in its own way. Or when William M. in Galaxy 4 starts talking about the Doctor's upcoming regeneration, which... If you're reading these in story order, that probably makes no sense in context. Yeah, I mean, this is completely off topic, but I have to admit, I actually love that novelization. It is bizarre. Our panelists love that novelization. And yet the original story, as we now see from the animated version, is uh, not quite great. It's funny because Jim Sangster, who's going through the books uh, one a week on his blog and posting on Twitter, just did Galaxy 4 because he's going in publication order too. Yeah. So he just released his review of Galaxy 4 this past weekend. He loved it. He was he was a huge fan of it, which I wouldn't have predicted that because uh, obviously the story is not necessarily beloved and some of M's prose style is not as you know adept as Terrence uh, to be charitable. But it no, it seems to be it seems to be a beloved novelization all around Galaxy Four. Yeah, because again, there are additions there that don't necessarily change the story, but they definitely expand upon it, which is exactly what Terrence Dix is doing with Day of the Daleks. And that brings us to the episode four material of Day of the Daleks. So that's the last three chapters of the book. It's only twenty six pages, at least in the pinnacle. So it's a lot shorter than the episode one material. 
But you've got some more great chapter titles here. Chapter 12 is Return to Danger, which is almost but not quite the classic Escape to Danger (laughs) that Terrence would later end up uh, owning. Mm -hmm. Chapter 13 is The Day of the Daleks, which is the name of the story right there. Oh, yeah. And then chapter 14, All Kinds of Futures, is where he goes back and he reinserts that scene that the director couldn't be bothered to film. Yeah, which makes so much more sense. So comparing episode four as a conclusion to the story on TV, and given that Terrence has run out of pages to describe it in the book, but has to use some of those pages to novelize material that never got filmed, how do you compare the televised part four to what Terrence is able to do in the book? Ah, the televised part four comes down with a bump. I I hate to say that, but it really does. You've got this Dalek raid on the house, which isn't a raid at all. It's just two Daleks and a couple of Ogrons kind of gliding up and killing off unit soldiers and then getting blown up in what is possibly one of the least convincing explosions that they've (laughs) had to do. So there's that. And the fact that, and I had to be reminded of this looking back over my notes, there's no incidental music over that whole sequence. You know, I'd forgotten that. I would have watched it about eight or nine months ago, but I'd forgotten that there was no music. Yep, there's no music. That's something else that the, I believe the special edition actually um, adds back in because it needs it. It really needs something like that. Whereas Terrence Dix, again expands on that and makes it seem like the stakes are much higher than just a couple of really ratty Daleks trundling up and speaking in weird accents and killing off unit soldiers. Do you notice also, Jason, that the extermination effects in that story are just bizarre compared to every other extermination? It was the first time that we had a color extermination effect. Yeah. And it's a weird freeze frame kind of thing. So it's like the people are frozen in time, but they don't actually express any pain over it. It's like, really? Okay, that's interesting. But the stakes are there on the page. I think that's the one with the disintegrator gun that the Ogrons use. It freezes the person, and then there's a bad edit, and the frame jumps half an inch to the right, and the person has just disappeared. (laughs) Yep, poof. (sighs) Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and that's the one story where the Doctor starts casually shooting down Ogrons with a gun as if the author had never watched Doctor Who before. Oh, I know. Uh, it is odd. That I think Terrence preserves that for the book. This is early days, and this is before he came up with Never Cruel or Cowardly. Yeah. And if you think about it, that's not necessarily cruel or cowardly when we're talking about the, the fate of humanity. I mean, True. if if Ogrons are coming to kill you and he's already tried, remember there's that wonderful sequence that we get described in absolute detail of him trying to take out the Ogron with Venusian Akito and it's not working. And Joe just kills it with the, um, with the bottle of wine. And then the doctor complains about (laughs) losing the wine. (laughs) That's right. That's right. And there's an illustration of that moment too. Oh, in wow. the targeted version, in the target version, and that that's just great. So he already knows. So even stuff like that, there's internal logic going on. Um, in fact, we haven't talked about this yet, but you probably did in the first part of the show. The fact that the controller is given so much more motivation on the page mm. than he is on screen. On screen, you can kind of tell that he's really not on the Dalek side and would really kind of like the Resistance to be able to uh, win in the end. But on the page, it's set up from his very first appearance, and it's a remarkable bit of psychological writing that Dix doesn't always do in later novelizations. And this was the time in the target line when Malcolm Hulk and Terrence were both writing books alongside each other Mm -hmm. and they each wrote you know three or four books a year until malcolm runs out of stories to novelize and terrence picks up the slack but malcolm and i talked about this last week um when i did doomsday weapon and i know we talked about it a couple of years ago when i was on your show talking about doomsday weapon malcolm hulk was doing full-on character briefs and Mm -hmm. terrence really doesn't do that he doesn't really internalize the characters apart from the occasional acerbic one sentence aside where the character starts internally mocking the script 
But here he does, or he tries to do for the controller what Malcolm Hulk would have done, which is get into the controller's biography and psyche and uh, Freudian motivations. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And if you think about it, if, if it had been a Malcolm Hulk novelization, we'd probably find out how, where the controller was born, what the circumstances were of his rise to power, how he always felt bad about it throughout his years, but when as he rose to power, he justified it to himself by saving as many lives as he could. Uh, we don't really get that in the Dick's version, and we don't have to, because we get what we do get still expands that character greatly. Right. Well, Tony, thanks so much for joining me on Day of the Daleks. This was a lot of fun. I think we Absolutely. managed to spend about half the time talking about the book, but I have a question. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question for you before we conclude. Yeah. On the last page of the Pinnacle edition, because Pinnacle did this, but Target never did. Pinnacle advertises their other book lines at the same time. Mm-hmm. And they had a long run of pulp slash sci-fi slash semi-erotic slash TV tie-in books being sold alongside the Doctor Who's. So the last page is I'm going to show you now <laughs> the night <Knight> rider books, <laughs> David Hasselhoff's face in a poorly shadowed diamond. <sighs> Book number two in the night rider series is trust doesn't rust. Oh my God. Now I imagine you can find that book somewhere online and I but may have to, want to? <laughs> buy it. Do you think that trust doesn't rust is going to have the same level of detail and pro style and care that Terrence Dix puts into his, his target slash pinnacles. Well, not that I'm an expert or anything, but I would have to say no. <laughs> I think as the, I think as a doctor who literature podcast challenge, I think I'm going to have to order trust doesn't rust and devote a special edition to it. Oh my God. Well, I can guarantee you this. It's not going to have an introduction by Harlan Ellison. No, I'm pretty sure Harlan Ellison would not have been a fan of the Knight Rider. Having heard his thoughts on the Twilight Zone series from the mid-1980s, I can't imagine he would have been a big fan of the Knight Rider. No, no. (laughs) All right. Tony, thank (laughs) you so much for joining me. Where can my listeners find you and your amazing podcast online? Okay, you can find us on SoundCloud. We're at soundcloud.com forward slash DW... Oh, sorry. We're at soundcloud.com forward slash Doctor Who Target BC because we ran out of characters, obviously. So, <laughs> And you can also find us on Spotify if you do a search for us there, and on iTunes, and anywhere good podcasts are found, and even podcasts like ours. I subscribe to you through Google Podcasts, so I get you in my subscription box every Sunday, so I encourage all of my listeners to do the same. Oh, I did not know they were doing that for us. That's good to know. Great. <laughs> All right, thanks, and I hope to have you back again sometime soon. Uh, sometime soon, I should say. Tony, have a great night. You too. Thank you. My thanks to Tony hip, hip, for joining me. Hooray! And thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Doctor Who Literature Podcast. I'm Jason, your host and editor and producer. This podcast is brought to you by Anchor and can also be found on Spotify and Google Podcasts. You can find me on Twitter at Doctor Who Novels, that's DR Who Novels. Then you can also find me on the Trap One podcast. I write about Doctor Who on Twitter using the hashtag Doctor Who Pilgrimage or DR Who Pilgrimage. Please drop me a line with your comments, questions, suggestions. Next time we'll be discussing Doctor Who and the Demons from October 1974, and again joined by a very special guest. Thank you for listening, and keep turning the pages. <laughs>